Return of Castle Wolfenstein is one of the best first person shooters ever made. It's a game that perfectly encapsulates old school shooting mechanics and design. Brutally difficult, unforgiving and crushing at times. You're playing as a cross between a special forces soldier and Indiana Jones. It was essentially a reboot for this series, the previous titles being both Spear of Destiny and the original Wolfenstein 3D, and it managed to carry across those key elements of both shooting Nazis and collecting treasure. You're behind enemy lines in Europe, trying to stop the Nazis from resurrecting an ancient warlord named Heinrich. A dude who almost single-handedly took over the world with his army of undead knights. I mean, it's pretty metal. Heinrich. Your reign of terror must end. You fool. You know as well as I that I cannot be destroyed. Return of Castle Wolfenstein originally came out in 2001 to glowing praise and it's gone on to be remembered as an absolute classic for the genre. Everyone seemed to love it apart from Jeff Gerstmann who later said that the campaign was uninteresting and rarely exciting. Originally a PC exclusive, it eventually got ported to the Xbox and the PlayStation 2 a couple of years later in 2003. With the Xbox port being worked on by Nerve Software and the PlayStation 2 port by Rasta Productions. Yeah, remember those guys? Both versions got different names too. The Xbox version was called Tides of War and the PlayStation 2 version was called Operation Resurrection, which was the original name of the final mission in the base game. The Xbox port is the closest to the original game, but the only problem it has is its frame rate. It's terrible. The Xbox port though keeps the multiplayer mode, whereas the PlayStation 2 version doesn't. Now, this is pretty huge because the multiplayer is arguably as classic and treasured as the single player is. But by and large, they were both pretty decent console ports at a time when console ports are often really lackluster. Now, for all intents and purposes, this is still just the same old Return to Castle Wolfenstein from the PC. You'll sneak or shoot your way through a bunch of different missions, taking on Nazi soldiers, zombies and mutants with an MP40, FG42 and a goddamn minigun. These console ports don't mess around with the core of Wolfenstein itself, but like they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But there are a few differences here and there which make them pretty unique. Could be minor things like how the whole sprint and stamina system has just been removed entirely. Now you still collect vintage German wine, but you use it as a portable healing item instead of replenishing your stamina bar. And those cool looking beer steins are just gone completely. Wine good, beer bad I guess. In both versions, you're first greeted by a pretty awesome main menu with this sweeping cinematic shot across the castle, which reminds me a lot of the main menu from Unreal. Also, does the music during this main menu on the PS2 version sound familiar to you? Because to me, it sounds a lot like James Horner's music from Aliens. I mean, check this out. During the trailer that plays if you leave the main menu idle too long, it even sounds like that track from Aliens when they're escaping the hive. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Anyway, one of the main differences between these versions and the PC is this entirely new prologue mission, which is called Cursed Sands, and it takes place in Egypt before BJ and Agent 1 are captured. And you have to play through this before you even get to Castle Wolfenstein. The whole objective is that you've got BJ and Agent 1 working together to try and stop Helga von Bulau from recovering a bunch of ancient tablets from some underground tomb. You'll sneak through a bunch of Nazi outposts and bases, killing Egyptian mercenaries, sabotaging equipment and stealing a bunch of documents, then trying to make contact with Agent 1, before you both head into the tombs to take on Helga's elite guards. If you're playing the Xbox version, instead of the mercenaries, you're now fighting dudes in turbans and robes, who kind of look like those guys who helped Indiana Jones find the Ark of the Covenant. What's super weird too is how these new levels are just chock full of cinematics, where we even get to see BJ talking, which is kind of odd considering he didn't really utter so much as a single word in the original game. Damn Nazis, sounds like the welcoming committee. This is too hot, check the map for someplace else to land. Outside of just grunting in pain when he took damage or grunting in pain when he saw photos of your sister. 
These cinematics are pretty well done, there's a decent amount of effort with the lip syncing, and the voice actor for Agent 1 should even sound familiar to Metal Gear Solid fans, because it's voiced by the same dude who voiced Major Zero in Metal Gear Solid 3. There's an entrance to the lower tombs from the airfield, and if all goes well we should be able to meet up there. I actually don't mind these levels, and they're also a lot different from the kind of environments we saw in the base game, considering that took place exclusively in Europe. Being able to explore all these Egyptian locations and skulk through spooky tombs covered in ancient hieroglyphics makes for a nice change of scenery. These prologue missions also kind of mirror the first few missions of the base game if you really think about it. I mean, they both start off with you having very little weapons and having to use stealth to avoid being overwhelmed by enemies. Then it becomes a bit more action packed as you find the MP40 and start getting into more gunfights before some more horror themed series of levels where you're taken on undead creatures. In the original game it was the zombies in the German catacombs, but now it's mummies in ancient tombs, sticking with the whole Egyptian theme they've got going. The only difference is that the mummies can't shoot those floating skulls at you, they're instead relegated to just walking towards you slowly. Both the tombs and the crypts are full of booby traps, and there's hidden areas and you'll see the Nazis in combat with the undead. Both series of levels also feature Helga as the sort of main antagonist and her elite guards serve as the most challenging enemy lineup. As a wise man once said, it's like poetry, it rhymes. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. The mission ends with BJ and Agent 1 being shot down in their plane as they're in pursuit of Helga. Then they're captured and brought back to Castle Wolfenstein. Hurry! Schnell! Schnell! And from this point on, the game turns into the Wolfenstein we all know and love, just with a few key differences. For starters, all of the briefing cinematics with those OSA guys sitting around in a dimly lit room have all been completely redone. The lip syncing is on point and there's even some basic cinematography with cutaways and close-ups used for dramatic effect. Really? It's kind of weird how such a small detail can make something infinitely more interesting. I mean, I don't think I'm the only person who skipped all those cinematics in the original game because of just how boring they were. Good lord. What is kind of weird though is that all the other cinematics in the game are still the original ones. On the PlayStation 2 they're pre-rendered and not using the in-game engine to maybe help cut down on the load times. So you get this weird juxtaposition of these highly polished new cinematics with these old, boring, static ones. This had better be important. One of the first big differences with Operation Resurrection's main campaign is how they've changed some of the levels. Obviously the textures, the modelling and the lighting isn't quite as up to snuff as the PC version is. It's kind of like going from playing the game on the high graphics settings to turning the whole thing down to low. More than that though, some of the bigger levels are broken down into two parts now, which was pretty standard for console ports at the time. But then others have had significant changes which affects the flow of the levels entirely. When you're escaping from the castle in the opening mission now, the dungeon section has been expanded considerably. Instead of just walking past a bunch of locked cells, then being able to see the sky 12 seconds later, you're now moving through what feels like an actual dungeon. You even head up this huge winding staircase to the surface, feeling like you're dragging yourself up from the depths of hell. I mean, it definitely sets the scale of the castle's underground a lot better. The second part of this mission follows along closely to the original game, where you're just making your way through the castle to take a tram down to the nearby village. I did notice at this point just how much darker this console version is than the PC too, so word of advice, if you're going to play this thing, crank that brightness up to the max and never look back. With the Xbox version, the escape from the castle is completely unchanged from the PC version, and it's not broken down into multiple levels either, so you get to finish it as God intended. On the PlayStation 2, like the castle escape, the village is also completely different than before. Again broken up into two parts, now you've even got to complete a bunch of different objectives to mess with the Nazi supply chain, before then again heading to the cemetery to get into the catacombs, the cemetery looking entirely different too. Back on the Xbox, it follows the original game almost to a T. The only thing they've added is that now you can get this version's exclusive weapon, the shotgun. <laughs> This thing shows up early in this mission, and ammo for it is about as rare as photos of your mum with their clothes on. I can see why though, because it pretty much kills everyone in a single shot. You don't even really need to be all that accurate, you just put your crosshair on an enemy's general position, and then the buckshot does the rest. 
Coming across this shotgun for the first time is just amazing and such a welcome surprise. Like waking up to a hand job or finding another line of cocaine inside a line of cocaine. I don't even think that makes sense. I'm so tired. Onward to the catacombs, it plays out mostly the same, aside from again being split up across two levels on the PlayStation 2. I think the placement of zombies might be different, but this is all pretty much spot on to the original, right up until the boss fight with Helga. They even added in this neat effect on the PlayStation 2, where when she's killed, you can see all of these souls escaping her body, which looks awesome. With the Xbox port, you'll encounter these new cultist enemies who shoot out lightning bolts. They kind of remind me a bit of the Hitler ghost from Wolfenstein 3D. Next up is the forest level, and anyone who's played the original is going to remember just how much of a pain in the ass this thing was. Basically, you had to sneak across this huge map without setting any alarms off, recovering a bunch of your weapons along the way. It was a really tricky mission and easily one of the most challenging in the entire game for a first time playthrough. It was possible for the AI to be super unpredictable and just pretty much cause a mission restart. Well, you'll be glad to know that on the PlayStation 2, at least for the first half of this mission, you don't have to worry about setting off an alarm at all. They've just done away with that entirely. You'll be greeted by a machine gun nest as soon as the level starts, and there's a few patrolling Nazis here and there, but it doesn't really matter all that much because you're just free to go in guns blazing. The second half of this level, though, you'll still have to remain undetected, though I did notice that the AI seemed to be a lot more lenient this time around. It's almost like they've got no peripheral vision or something, and unless you're standing right in front of them, they often don't see you at all. One problem that does arise, though, is the decreased draw distance because of the PlayStation 2 not being as powerful as the PC. Again, the Xbox version reigns supreme with a much better draw distance, and to make it even easier, you get the snooper rifle right at the beginning of the mission. You'll also notice the brand new water effect that the Xbox version has, and I gotta admit, it looks pretty good. This version also keeps the same layout from the original, so that means if you're detected at any time, it's game over. From here on in though, for pretty much the remainder of the campaign, both versions stick to the original level design pretty closely. With Tides of War though, you'll start encountering a few new enemies and mechanics. When you reach the weapons facility, Nazi robot dogs with venom guns on their backs start smashing out of inconspicuous looking crates, and you'll see these things a fair bit from here on in. For the Lopers, you get an energy shield which deflects their electricity, lasting all of 5 seconds. For the Uber Soldiers, you'll find an EMP device which temporarily shuts them down for all of 5 seconds. Still, it does make them a little bit less of a pain to deal with, seeing that fighting them can sometimes be about as fun as dragging sandpaper across your pee hole. The PS2 version though lacks all of this new stuff, I think the only other major difference is all of the new secret areas. Yeah, you see, in Operation Resurrection, for every secret area you find now, you get a bonus point. And then when you get a certain amount of bonus points, you can spend them on an upgrade for BJ in between levels. Things like increasing your maximum health points, armor or ammo. And it's kind of a good thing because it actually encourages you to search out secret areas. And it gives you an incentive to do so because now you're able to upgrade your character and become stronger. Tides of War doesn't have this mechanic, but if you find all of the secrets in a single level, you get a bonus, like extra ammo for a weapon, goody gumdrops. Don't take that patronizing tone with me. Both of these versions, I think, are about on par with how difficult Return to Castle Wolfenstein is. But look, I don't really care what anyone says. Playing a shooter on a mouse and a keyboard is always superior and easier to playing it on a controller. It's just a fact of life. I mean, I can play both styles, but I think the mouse and keyboard's always going to reign supreme. How do these console ports deal with that? Well, by giving you a pretty handy lock-on system. So what happens is once you aim at an enemy, the crosshair changes color and kind of snaps onto them until you move it away or they die. And it makes it handy because enemies in this game are very mobile and don't like to sit still. It's just an intuitive way to ensure you can focus more on actually shooting things. One thing that did piss me off though about Operation Resurrection was how they've removed the whole crouch shooting mechanic from the original. In Return to Castle Wolfenstein, if you crouch when firing a weapon, it pretty much removed like 99% of the weapon spread. If you were standing when shooting, the weapon spread would be crazy, sending bullets in every direction. 
You can see this happening to the AI all the time when they're shooting at you full auto from a distance. And all of these tracer rounds are just flying out in all directions. Now the thing is that they seem to have kept this in the Xbox port, but it seems to be completely absent for the PlayStation 2. So now whether you're standing or crouching, it doesn't seem to do jack shit. Damn. And it becomes a real problem later in the game with the paratroopers and the elite guard, at the point when they all turn into bullet sponges who shrug off direct headshots like it's a minor nuisance. You wanna know what I also don't like? When you fire the Sten gun in Tides of War, instead of showing an actual meter on whether or not the weapon is overheating like it does in the PC version, instead the color of the weapon icon becomes redder and redder. Operation Resurrection though keeps the more handier looking meter in. What's also odd is how the Xbox version saves your progress automatically. You can get up to three or four checkpoints per mission along with a super fast manual save system which you can reload from whenever you want instantly. The PlayStation 2 version has manual saves and only manual saves. I mean, you can save at any time, but there's not even any kind of mission restart. It makes you go all the way back to the last time you saved. Just a couple of examples of how both these ports have their good and bad points. Still, for a console shooter and a console port of a shooter, they play surprisingly well most of the time. Consoles, and the PlayStation 2 in particular, often bore the brunt of horrible ports of otherwise really good PC games. No One Lives Forever, Soldier of Fortune, and Max Payne are good example of this, and usually whenever these games made their way to the Xbox or the GameCube, they often fared up better. Which is the case for pretty much all of the Medal of Honor games that ever saw the light of day on the GameCube, that's for sure. With these two Wolfenstein ports though, it's kind of hard to pick the better one. I mean, the Xbox One is pretty good because it's still faithful to the original, adding in the new prologue mission, a few new enemies here and there, and arguably one of the best weapons in the game with the shotgun. But the frame rate is so bad at times, and always at the kind of moments when you really don't want it to tank, like when you're fighting the Lopers or the Uber Soldiers. PlayStation 2 port tries a few new things, changing the layout of levels entirely, splitting missions up into two or three parts, and adding in an interesting player upgrade system. And it at least seems to be a bit more consistent in its performance. It starts to make sense why these are both given different titles after you've played them, because they're really not the same game at all. Good lord. So I gotta say, I don't think there's a better version. I think they're both unique and interesting. I mean, if someone told you you could pick from Heidi Klum, Jane Seymour, or have both of them, you're clearly going to pick both, right? If nothing else, playing through these reminded me just how good the original game is, and just how far the series has strayed from this formula in recent years. And despite all these downsides these ports have, they're still better than the new Colossus. 